Imagine, you're in your kitchen preparing dinner for guests. Your signature chicken frittata sizzling in a black cast iron skillet. But you're distracted by the mojitos. <laughs> and with very unexpert timing, you reach down and grasp the handle of that skillet and immediately realize that the potholder is aptly named and absent. You flood your hand with cold water, but soon see white blistered skin rising from your palm, and the lightest touch of that skin with a tissue causes it to peel away with a searing pain. You've just sustained a severe burn over 1% of your skin's surface. Now, imagine a 10-year-old girl hospitalized in the burn center after a pot of boiling pasta water fell onto her chest and her arms. That same blistered skin, that same searing pain, only her burn covers 30% of her skin surface. But that's not the worst of it. Modern burn care will require that her care team, her compassionate care team, inflict the essential daily torture on her to achieve the best final clinical result. Torture in the form of scrubbing her burned skin to prevent infection and stretching her taut new skin to maintain its flexibility and its function, a daily torment that she will endure for weeks to months. Now, potent pain medicines can help ease the pain, but their relief is only partial and they carry their own significant risks of side effects and even addiction. But there is a non-drug method that can help this girl cope with her daily torture. Immersive virtual reality, or VR, helps reduce her perception of her burn care pain by donning a lightweight VR headset and entering a virtual world that not only blocks out the immediate sights and sounds of her painful burn care, but carries her mind to a place far away from her current distress. To make the connection between pain relief and VR, let me start with a statement. Pain is all in your head. Now, I don't say this as an unsympathetic judgment, so let me explain what I mean by making a distinction between two important pain concepts, the stinger and the pain experience. The stinger is what pain scientists call nociception and refers to the body's initial nervous system response to a painful event, generates a signal that travels up toward the brain. For example, when you step barefoot onto a hot, blacktop in August. Heat sensors under your skin generate an impulse that travels up your leg, up your spinal cord, towards your brain. In contrast, the pain experience is your interpretation, perception, and response to that stinger. The pain experience can be affected by a bunch of different factors. Fear, anxiety, sadness, previous pain experiences. And for any given stinger, the pain experience is subjective, it's variable, and it's unpredictable. In fact, if you take a group of volunteers and subject them to the exact same stinger, in this case, a small bar heated to 120 degrees Fahrenheit touching their hand, all 17 of these volunteers rate their pain differently on a zero to 10 pain scale ranging from one to nine. What does this example show us? The pain experience is in fact all in our head. Because there's some type of signal modulation that's happening between the stinger and the pain experience. Sometimes for the better, resulting in a lesser pain experience, and sometimes for the worse, resulting in a greater pain experience. Now, we don't really understand the details of this signal modulation, but the concept isn't new. Over 50 years ago, Patrick Wall and Richard Meltzak 
made these same observations and coined their gate control theory of pain. As a result, pain today is not defined as a simple electric signal from the skin to the brain, but instead as a multi-dimensional experience consisting of three pain components, sensory, cognitive, and emotional. Now, knowing that these three components comprise the pain experience, we can potentially shift one's experience from high pain to low pain by purposefully manipulating one or more of these components. You may know of techniques that are based on this, uh, biofeedback, uh, hypnosis, distraction. But to show how VR can actually modify the pain experience, let's think back to that little girl in the burn center. Over two decades ago, two University of Washington psychologists, one an early pioneer in VR systems design named Hunter Hoffman, and the other practicing pain-relieving hypnosis in burn patients, David Patterson, got together with the idea of applying immersive virtual reality to distract patients during their burn care procedures. And they specifically targeted two components of the pain experience, the cognitive component and the emotional component. Now, from the cognitive perspective, the human mind can only muster a fixed amount of conscious attention to any event. And stinger events, particularly scrubbing burned skin, demand enormous amounts of conscious attention. The sight of horrific-looking skin as the dressing is first peeled away, flashbacks to the boiling water, flash-forwards, to the potential disability and disfigurement that can occur after some burns, all combine to amplify the pain experience as the patient's conscious attention is focused fully on the site of that burn. The psychologist's thinking was, if they could take some of that attention away from the stinger and direct it elsewhere, their pain experience would be different. They created a virtual world with pleasing sights and sounds that replaced the frightening medical sights and sounds of the care environment. The virtual world was specifically designed to conjure up a setting that was opposite that of a hot burn, an icy, cool blue Arctic canyon <laughs> filled with dancing penguins, snowmen, igloos, snowflakes, and it included snowball throwing contests to make the experience interactive and attention grabbing. And remember, these patients are quite sick. So the world did not have to be as elaborate and detailed as today's commercially available gaming worlds, but in fact, merely attention grabbing and interactive. <laughs> From the emotional point of view, it's well known that Sadness and depression can exacerbate the pain experience, whereas the opposite emotions, happiness, will have the opposite effect. So the world was designed to have interactive gaming features, animated characters, pleasing music, all designed to generate an emotion of happiness in the users. The first application of VR distraction for pain relief in the Burns Center was in 1998 in two teenage boys using a state-of-the-art VR system that cost almost $100,000, consisted of a mini-computer the size of a dorm fridge, <laughs> and a head-mounted display that was like wearing a hiking boot box <laughs> with the boots inside. <laughs> Nonetheless, compared to the results the boys reported when they were distracted by a simple televised conventional video game, their pain scores for all three components of the pain experience were less than half. And their reported anxiety scores were also significantly lower. Flash forward. In the 20 years since I joined Hunter and Dave to help create the University of Washington's virtual reality pain relief research team, we've expanded the clinical uses and scientific understanding of VR distraction pain relief. 
We've used the technique in hundreds of burn patients during painful wound care and painful physical therapy. And when added to standard drug therapy, immersive virtual reality typically reduces their subjective pain complaints by 40%. But even more cool is the fact that these same individuals report a positive emotion, simply fun, during these torturous experiences that are three times higher than with standard drug therapy alone. Okay. Which means that these patients are going to be more likely and more motivated the next day to participate in that same painful procedure, knowing that that procedure will eventually lead to the best possible medical outcome. Now, beyond the setting of burn care, VR distraction has been applied over a wide range of pain settings. Uh, dental care, painful physical and rehabilitation therapy, urologic surgery, labor pain during childbirth, blood sampling, intravenous catheter placement, and even cancer chemotherapy. And the technique has been applied to patients as young as six months of age and as old as 86 years of age. Now, what's more exciting even to me is, well, the results we've observed in the pain uh, laboratory. Now, this is a place where we use various types of safe stingers in human volunteers to better understand the biology of, of VR pain relief. We have shown, for example, that if you make thoughtful combinations of VR hardware and VR software, you can increase a user's sense of presence in the virtual world, their feeling of being inside the virtual world, which is a factor that is statistically strongly correlated with the pain relief that they have. We've also shown that patients who use the technique day after day after day have no diminution in the pain relieving effect. In other words, it's not just a novelty effect that wears off with time. And using live brain imaging techniques like functional MRI scanning that actually show the brain in action, we've shown that immersive virtual reality will reduce pain-related brain activity. So we actually have two lines of evidence now. We have subjective evidence, patients' pain scores that they tell us, and objective evidence, watching the brain in action to suggest that VR distraction can relieve pain. And, and thinking back to the opioids we talked about, we've also shown that the pain relieving effects of VR distraction are comparable to those of opioids, both in terms of subjective scores and pain related brain activity. And moreover, if you combine the two techniques, the beneficial effects are additive. In other words, using both techniques is better than using either alone. As we shift into the next gear of applications of virtual reality to pain relief, I'm going to leave you with two thoughts that uh, excite this former young, wide-eyed engineer. Uh, first, unlike the clunky and expensive VR systems from two decades ago, Technology is incredible today. We can use lightweight virtual reality displays that cost only hundreds of dollars instead of the $40,000 we spent on that one two decades ago. And those devices are on the verge of being driven by portable cell phones, smartphones, and tablets. Now, this kind of portability brings an important scalability to the application of VR to various pain settings. And in fact, it takes it out of the hospital and it brings it into the hands of users, wherever they may be. VR pain relief might be used by a patient with chronic pain to self-treat at home their own unpredictable pain flares. Or in rural environments in the US, where healthcare resources may be limited. Or even in low and middle income countries worldwide where healthcare resources may be non-existent, but handheld device technologies have already penetrated daily life. Second, 
the scalability will allow us to move VR from being a simple distraction tool to treat pain, but instead facilitate other types of non-drug pain relief that in many cases require now a human therapist. Things like mindfulness-based meditation or cognitive behavioral therapy. So we really can harness low-cost, interactive, audiovisual technologies, specifically immersive virtual reality, to safely and broadly and cost-effectively improve pain control. Thank you. <laughs>